We've invited three speakers to share how and why African American communities are working together to enhance their food sovereignty. Uh, Kim Carr, a postdoctoral research assistant in food sovereignty and racial equity, will introduce her work. Malik Yakini will provide an overview of food sovereignty and its role in African American communities. Lily Fink. Uh, Shapiro will introduce us to U of M's Food Literacy for All program, and she, Malik, and Jerry Hebron will discuss their partnership in designing and co-leading um, that course and how the partnership is developed. At this point, I want to introduce Rich Pirag, who is also a member of our uh, work group, and he will introduce a poll for us and provide an overview and an introduction to our work group and our first speaker. There we go, we're ready to Rich. Okay, the, uh, so we are at the, this is the poll question we're going to uh, ask. And uh, you, you can see it coming up on your screen here. There's four choices. Uh, the question is to what extent does your organization uh, or group work with communities uh, that are predominantly African-American. Please pick one response. 33% uh, of those respondents uh, say they work extensively with communities that are predominantly African-American. 54% said uh, to a limited extent. 8% said they do not work at all. And 5% uh, said they do not know. And we're going to close the poll and move on. Same problem we had last time. Next. Okay, just a very briefly, uh, this uh, webinar is sponsored by the Racial Equity and Food System Work Group. Uh, it was initiated in 2018. It's a community of cooperative extension professionals, as well as many other community stakeholders. Probably 50% of our audience over the last year and a half have been nonprofit organizations, state, local, government, private organizations as well. We come together to connect, learn, and collaborate to facilitate change within these institutions and society to uh, build more racial equity within our food system. This uh, uh, group is funded in part by the Kellogg Foundation. It's also coordinated by the Center for Regional Food Systems. Just to want to give a shout out, uh, we're, uh, the committee is a national committee. Uh, there's pictures of all the folks that participate from all over the country. Um, with because there is some focus on cooperative extension, keep in mind there's 40 to 50,000 extension professionals around the country um, trying to um, influence extension to pr uh, use more of an equity lens in their work in food systems is, is very important uh, to this group. So shout out to all these folks and there's a subcommittee of them um, uh, that, including Renee, uh, that have put together uh, the, the, uh, this, this webinar. So I'm going to uh, move quickly and introduce uh, for just some brief comments, Kimberly Carr, who is, uh, came to uh, MSU in July as a postdoctoral research associate in food sovereignty and racial equity. She works both at the Center for Regional Food Systems at MSU and the Center for Interdisciplinarity. We're using the same screen, so I'm going to sort of slide out of the picture and uh, Kim's going to slide in. Okay. Thank you so much, Rich, for the brief introduction. As Rich stated that my postdoctoral position is a shared collaboration between Michigan State University's uh, CRFS and the Center for Regional Food System. I'm also a member of the Racial Equity in the Food System group. I will be receiving my PhD in Integrative Biosciences from Tuskegee University, which is a HBCU, and it's also an 1890s agricultural land grant school. I have a master's in public health um, degree from Morehouse School of Medicine, another HBCU, and a BS in biology in, from Albany State, which is another HBCU. So I wanted to provide a little context of my research here. So my research is in the context of food sovereignty and racial equity in Michigan. And I wanted to share very briefly my insights of what I've seen thus far um, starting in July. So food sovereignty and racial equity is a multidimensional um, concept. I'm not going to go deeply into those uh, concepts, considering there are three other presenters that would speak about that. But food sovereignty incorporates food access, food availability, 
um, manufacturing, and it's associated with culture, health, and justice. And to look at food sovereignty and racial equity on this type of dimension, you will have to, well, in my case, look at it through a systems thinking approach, seeing how these concepts are interrelated and seeing what these levels of food sovereignty looks like and how communities or even uh, academic institutions can benefit um, um, from this systems uh, thinking. In doing so, I will be using a comprehensive narrative frame or a lens that includes the food system approach, a justice approach, which is the environmental justice, food justice, social justice, and racial equity. Also going into my work, I realized that there has to be a change in paradigm from the academic institution. Often academic institutions or communities come from a deficit model of looking at a problem. What's the problem? That can easily go into what's wrong, and that goes into that moral dimension. So I switched from a deficit model to an asset-based model. What assets can be uplifted from the academic community to the community or grassroots organizations? And another empowering question is, do communities want this assistance and what does that look like instead of coming in as the expert? So it'd be um, uh, very collaborative. So the overall goal of my research is to develop a curriculum model module in institutional more so university classrooms that can be used by MSU Extension as well. So my process is right now, I'm conducting preliminary studies using the Michigan Behavior Risk Factor Surveillance System. And I will be conducting future studies using qualitative and or mixed methodologies. And informally, I have met with strategic community leaders like Malik McKinney and visiting with him at D-Town Forums as well as with Winona Bynum as well, the executive director of the Detroit Food Policy Council. And I'm glad to be here on this webinar today. Hey, thank you for that, Kim. We greatly appreciate um, just having uh, Kim here and a part of our team and particularly with our focus. At this point, I'd like to give a brief introduction for all of our speakers. Uh, Malik Kanyata Yakini is the co-founder and the executive director of the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. Uh, DBCFSN, as we finally call it, operates a seven acre urban farm and is spearheading the opening of a co-op grocery store in Detroit's North End. Malik views the good food revolution as part of a larger movement for freedom, justice, and equality. He has an intense interest in contributing to the development of an international food sovereignty movement that embraces black communities in the Americas, the Caribbean, and Africa. Lily Fink, Shapiro is a manager of U of M's Sustainable Food Systems Initiative, where she's worked since 2013 to expand interdisciplinary food systems research and curriculum on campus. She co-created and has co-taught the Food Literacy for All course since 2017, working in partnership with food justice and community leaders in Detroit to create a lasting community academic partnership. Welcome, Lily and Jerry Hebron, also from Detroit, is co-founder and executive director of the North End Christian Community Development Corporation, which operates Oakland Avenue Urban Farm, located in Detroit's historical North End community. The farm was designed on a community economic development model that engages residents, youth, entrepreneurs, and partners in creating a sustainable neighborhood food economy. We want to welcome all of our speakers and we're going to kick off the discussion uh, with Malik giving us some background and overview of how food sovereignty is understood, how it's used, and how it's practiced in African American communities. Welcome Malik. You guys can unmute. Uh, so good afternoon. First I want to bring greetings on behalf of the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network and also uh, I always have to acknowledge my ancestors upon whose backs much of the wealth of the Western world is built. Um, so I want to begin by discussing the concept of food sovereignty generally. Uh, the idea of food sovereignty was first advanced in 1996 by an international peasant organization called La Bia Campesina. And uh, they put forward several principles upon which a food sovereignty is based. And I'll go over those principles, or at least an interpretation of those principles uh, by the U.S. Food Sovereignty Alliance in just a minute. But there's a short definition that was developed in Mali in 2007 at, at the first global forum on food sovereignty. 
And that definition is that food sovereignty is the right of peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods and their right to define their own food and agricultural systems. It puts the aspirations and needs of those who produce, distribute, and consume food at the heart of food systems and policies rather than the demands of markets and corporations. And so in a nutshell, that's really what food sovereignty is. It's much more than food security, much more than making sure that people have adequate amounts of food, but it's really making sure that people have control of the system that produces their food and that they define how that food is produced and they have control of the of the land, the water, the seeds, and the other things that are necessary for production of food. So there are six uh, principles that um, the U.S. Food Sovereignty Alliance has interpreted as kind of encapsulating food sovereignty. And the first is that it focuses on food for people. Um, secondly, that it values food providers, those who are actually producing the food, the fishermen, fisherwomen, um, farmers, herders, and so on. It localizes food systems and creates a situation where both producers and consumers of food can work together to define their food system. Uh, it puts uh, control uh, locally. It builds knowledge and skills among those who are producing skills and across uh, various communities, and it works with nature. It's ecologically as sound as opposed to the current uh, food system, which is doing uh, tremendous damage to the environment. So uh, in terms of food sovereignty in African-American communities, it's really impossible to understand food sovereignty without understanding kind of the historical uh, circumstances of African-Americans in general. And it's maybe significant that 2019 is the 400th anniversary of the first enslaved Africans being brought to what we now call the United States of America. Uh, for all of that 400 years, I would submit that the primary struggle our people have been engaged in is a struggle for sovereignty in general, a struggle to regain the ability to define our own lives, to define what happens in our communities, to define our economic systems, to build uh, the political power, to determine what happens in our community, and to be able to define culturally how we want to live our lives. So the struggle for food sovereignty has to be understood within that context of the struggle for black sovereignty in general. Um, it's also significant, perhaps, that, um, uh, that tomorrow, December 4th, is the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Fred Hampton and Mark Clark. Uh, Fred Hampton was the Illinois chapter chair of the Black Panther Party, and he was assassinated by the Chicago Police Department and the FBI. And that's significant because the Black Panther Party played uh, an important role in building sovereignty in general in black communities, but also increasing food security, uh, particularly through their uh, breakfast program. So again, just to summarize, uh, food sovereignty in black communities is really part of the overall struggle for political, economic, and cultural empowerment. Um, but food sovereignty is particularly relevant for African Americans because of the history of enslavement, sharecropping, which followed uh, formal chattel slavery, uh, and the terror campaigns that followed uh, the elimination of chattel slavery, which were often designed to separate black people from the land that they had acquired. And then, of, of course, there were all kinds of uh, means that were both so-called legal means and extra legal means that were used to uh, take back the land that formerly enslaved Africans had acquired. And so this history of terror, land theft, enslavement, and sharecropping has left African Americans particularly vulnerable when it comes to having sovereignty over the system that produces our food and distributes our food. Um, so I'd like to talk about some contemporary examples, if we can go to the next slide, of groups on local levels throughout the United States that are, uh, we need to go back one slide that are engaged in building food sovereignty on a local level. And again, we need to go back one slide. There should be another slide in between there somewhere with some photos. And while hopefully while we're trying to find that slide, I'll, I'll keep talking. Um, 
there's several groups that I'd like to highlight. Uh, the first is a group in uh, There is no, uh, this is the first slide. There's no slide between this and this slide. Maybe it's after that. Okay, can you see if it's after that, maybe? No, I think No, it's not. Okay, I'm not sure what happened to it, but we'll keep moving and I'll try to describe what I had visuals for. You can show, hold it up. Um, the first is a farm in Mississippi, McCool, Mississippi. It's called TKO Farm, and that's run by uh, Teresa and Kevin Springs. And they are explicitly trying to build a uh, food sovereignty in an area where black people have historically a uh, farm, but where now, as in many places in the United States, uh, black farmers are having a, a rough time and are no longer, in many cases, in, engaged in farming. Um, the second example is Cooperation Jackson, which many people have heard of. They've been involved in efforts to build a solidarity economy in Jackson, Mississippi, and it really grows out of a larger plan that was devised by uh, the former mayor of Jackson, Mississippi, Shokwe Lumumba, and many other people who are involved in what's called the New African Independence Movement. So Cooperation Jackson is creating uh, farms and gardens in Jackson, Mississippi as a way of empowering that community and building an economic base and also building a way of uh, producing additional fresh locally grown food. The third example I'd like to highlight is in Detroit, D-Town Farm, which is run by the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. And at D-Town Farm, we grow more than 36 different fruits, vegetables, and herbs, and train people uh, annually in how to do urban farming. Uh, we also do uh, demonstration of the use of solar energy, of rainwater retention, beekeeping, season extension, uh, using hoop houses, so on and so forth. The fourth example is in Atlanta, Georgia, Truly Living Well Center for Natural Urban Agriculture has become a pillar of the urban ag movement in Atlanta, training many of the people who are now engaged in farming in Atlanta, and not only training them in the techniques necessary to do urban farming, but also in the ideas that drive uh, the food sovereignty movement there. And finally, an international example in Toronto, the African Food Basket is engaged in organizing primarily immigrants from the Caribbean and Africa in order to build community gardens and to do collective purchasing of produce and a collective buying club. So these are some of the efforts that are uh, being engaged in in local areas in North America to, uh, to build food sovereignty in black communities. But there's also a national organization that I like to highlight, which is the National Black Food and Justice Alliance, an organization that is working to build uh, food sovereignty by connecting many of these local efforts around the country. So the, the National Black Food and Justice Alliance uh, works in several different areas. Uh, one of the areas that we work in is what we call building self-determined food economies. Uh, what we find in African-American communities throughout the United States is that typically other ethnic groups come into the communities where we're the predominant population. They open the retail grocery stores and extract the profits from those stores so that our communities don't see any real benefit from the uh, economic, from the wealth that is created from the money that we spend on food. That money is extracted from our communities, other people become prosperous, and we find ourselves in the situation of having to ask other people for jobs and not having sufficient money to build the institutions and infrastructure in our community to be uh, self-reliant and self-respecting. Uh, the second major area that the National Black Food and Justice Alliance works in is what we call black land and power. Um, in the 1960s and 70s, we used to say a lot that land is the basis of power, that it's from the land that food is produced. Um, you know, there are some, some more modern uh, techniques such as rooftop gardening and vertical farms that perhaps aren't using soil as directly, but 99% of the food on the earth is grown on land, whether that be plant or animal food. Um, it's also from the land that we extract the resources that are needed to build a modern technological civilizations, and it's on the land that we actually live and build community. And so uh, the redistribution of land is a fundamental uh, principle of uh, the movement for uh, black food sovereignty in the United States and for food justice and equity. 
Uh, right now, uh, only a very small percentage of farmland in the United States is owned by African Americans. The vast majority is owned by whites. And that leads to a situation where African Americans find ourselves dependent primarily on whites who are running the industrial food system to provide our food. So I'll end by just saying that uh, you can get more information on the National Black Food and Justice Alliance at our website, which is www.blackfoodjustice.org. Again, that's www.blackfoodjustice.org. And I'd like to now turn it over to my colleagues, Lily Fink Shapiro and Jerry Hebron. The audience right now we're going to have an overview of the food literacy program uh, where Lily is going to share her background about that and how it works on campus and engage with um, Malik and Jerry about how that works in partnership in community. Thanks Lily. Great, thanks for having us. I'm really excited to share about this course that's based at the University of Michigan. The course is called Food Literacy for All and starting in January will be our fourth year of the course. And I was just talking to a group of students last week, and so I'll tell you what I told them, which is that I think it's the coolest course on campus, and that's for a lot of different reasons. So I'll just kind of give an overview of the structure of, of how, kind of how the course works. Um, so it's a, it's a really unique course here. Well, let's go to the next slide. It's a unique course in many ways. These headlines just kind of give you an idea. So for one, the course brings national leaders to Michigan for the lecture series. Um, it's also, the food systems course opens doors to the community, so it's open both to students to take for credit, like a typical university class, and it's also open to community members to attend for free, which that is not the case with most university courses. Um, the second unique thing, you can go to the next slide, is that the leadership team for the course is a combination of folks from the university, which includes myself and rotating faculty members from different schools in the university, and from leaders in Detroit. So for the first two years of the course, Malik was the community co-instructor, and then last year, and again this year, Jerry is the co-instructor. Um, we also work closely in the planning process with a couple of Detroit-based community organizations. So you see here under community partners, we work closely with the Detroit Food Policy Council, um, and Food Lab Detroit is also a key partner. So um, that is really unique, and, and uh, I just wanna emphasize that and Jerry can talk more about this, but that the course is really co-planned and co-taught and that every decision about the course is really made in full collaboration and partnership. Um, so there's 300 seats in the lecture hall and about 150 of those typically are reserved for students enrolled in the course getting credit and the other 150 are reserved for community members to come for free. So you can go to the next slide. Um, every Tuesday evening, we invite, I think the best way to say this is that we invite food systems rock stars from around the country and sometimes internationally to come and speak to the class. So this is a picture of Dara Cooper here. Um, Dara Cooper, so for example, we, we invite the speakers to come to campus and then a lot of our speakers also participate in events, free events in the community. So when Dara was here, the day after her food literacy for all talk, she participated in an event in Detroit and we actually timed, uh, worked with her to time her visit based on when there was gonna be, is it the annual gathering? I think it's the any big regional gathering for the Black Food um, and Justice Alliance. So that's just an example of the kinds of things that our speakers come on campus and then often participate in community-based events as well. Um, I'll just share a couple of things that I've learned about the class. So I think when we were first when we had our, one of our very first planning meetings, and this is with Malik, and we were um, talking about the themes for the semester and what are we gonna cover, and we're like, okay, this is, we want one class to focus on food, food waste, and we want one class to focus on agroecology, and one to focus on food and health, and the way that I was originally thinking of it, I was like, okay, let's make sure we have a class focused on food justice and equity, and I'm so glad that, I mean, I've learned a lot over these years, but one thing that Malik pointed out right away, and it's totally changed my frame of thinking, it's like, no, 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 you don't have one class that's based around equity and justice. That is a theme throughout the course. That is not, that doesn't get put in a box. That's not just one little thing that we cover on our, we, we check that off one, one um, course. So that's really influenced, I think, a lot of the course and the theme for, so there's, there's um, food justice, 
themes throughout, equity themes throughout the course. Um, you can go to the next slide and we can just flip through. There's different speakers. You can see um, snippets of the talks. This is Sean Sherman, who spoke last year. He's the founder of a company called The Sous Chef and keep going. Here's from our first year of the class, Raj Patel giving his talk. Keep going. So another way that we have engaged Detroiters is that we worked with the Detroit Food Policy Council to offer free shuttles to and from Detroit. Um, we've, we've tried various ways to engage folks and this wound up working pretty well last year, so I think we'll do that again for, we do that about once a month or so. Okay, you can keep going. All right, so I'm gonna pass this off to Jerry to talk about what it's like to be a community co-instructor, what the experience is like on the community side. So hi, my name is Jerry Hebron. I'm with the Oakland Avenue Urban Farm. And I just wanna say that, you know, this is such a unique um, opportunity to be able to bring uh, people on the ground working at the, at the community level uh, and partnering with the academic level to actually plan a lecture series like this. Um, it's unique in that it shows that what's happening on the ground is really respected and trusted so that uh, we are able to really connect uh, with the academics in terms of planning a class that is open to students and encouraging community folks to, to come in and share what is actually happening so that the students get more of a practical as well as learning, uh, academic learning experience. So uh, it's been um, a really great experience for me uh, from community being able to be a part of this and open my eyes and build uh, so many lasting relationships with uh, lecturers, but even the students are continuing to reach out, reach out to us. And just to echo some of what Jerry was saying, is that we, it's really important to us that, that one of the core tenets of the class is that it's not just, we don't, we, we believe that knowledge does not reside in the university, that we recognize deep knowledge in the community and community leaders in indigenous communities, and that it's not, the expertise is not in the ivory tower, it's not just in the university. And so a lot of our, spe our speakers are usually a combination of academics, and grassroots community folks and activists, um, but that is a core that is a core part of the class. Um, so, do you want to talk a little bit about why this works? I, I just want to say that yeah, the partnership works because we build trust. We build trust uh, from uh, the academic level, but we also build trust with the community level. And I and it's interesting that even relationships from the lecturers that come in around the country, we're able to, hey, call and say, I'll be in your town, uh, can we get together? Uh, and it broadens that experience of just knowledge um, and being able to nurture, continuing to nurture those relationships. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, Malik's gotta say something here. Yes. Yeah, so one of the things that was very um, kind of inviting for me about this class is the fact that we can share, as Jerry said, these national experts with people on the ground in Detroit. So they get to come to Detroit, some of the speakers, not all, some get to come to Detroit and share their expertise with, with people in Detroit. But also it's a two-way, a reciprocal relationship because those speakers also get to come to Detroit and learn about what's going on here and then as they're traveling around the country, they're able to share that. And so making sure that we have this um, multi-directional learning, that we're valuing the knowledge that exists in the communities, that we're partnering with academic institutions are all important reasons for this partnership. And I would just add, um, regarding the, the planning experience, um, it actually is happens in Detroit at our farm, which is amazing because I think um, at, at the university level, whenever I'm on campus, it's like overwhelming, daunting for me, but uh, having the team come to the farm and we're actually 
in a more casual, relaxed um, community environment doing the planning, uh, people coming in, dropping in uh, unexpectedly. <laughs> yeah, always. Even international folks show up occasionally. Uh, but it's, 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 a, it's a more relaxed um, experience and being able to have those deep conversations and build relationships. Um, I found it interesting to be able to, uh, when we are on campus prior to the lectures, maybe share a meal mm -hmm. with some of the folks that are coming in to speak, um, really bonds us mm -hmm. in terms of a unit and that we're all uh, learning from each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and then going into the lecture uh, hall to actually hear the lectures, we, we already have built some type of close-knit relationship and we've done that over fold. Um, and it's, it's a very meaningful, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. uh, how mm -hmm. you design that to happen that way. Uh, because we know uh, with food, it breaks down a lot of barriers. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So one way, can, can you go to the next slide? Before we go to Q&A. Go ahead and say that again. Hi, I just want to give you a quick time check. You got about five minutes before we transition to Q&A. Okay, no problem. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Can you, can you hit the next slide when you have a minute? So just a couple, just a couple other outcomes of the course. Um, so, so all of the class, so for everyone who's on the webinar, first of all, if you are in Michigan, the class starting in January will be primarily on Tuesday nights take place in Ann Arbor and some events and other around Michigan. You're welcome to come, or if you're not local, you can watch the videos. Just Google Food Literacy for All or Food Literacy for All You Mich as in University of Michigan. Um, you'll find all the videos of all three years so far. So they're, they're just on YouTube. They're free and available. Go to the next slide. Um, uh, we know that people around the world are watching these, so it's exciting to see that global impact. Go to the next slide. We asked folks who attended the course, either in person or remotely, we, we asked them what, as an open-ended question, what do you, what themes stick with you from the course? What are the most memorable and everyone wrote in what they thought, and then we categorized them into groups, and far and away, the themes of food justice and equity um, were the most meaningful of the course. So that definitely seemed relevant to our core mission. Next slide. So here's a couple other quick stats of just how many community members we've engaged each year. And then also for a course based in Ann Arbor, um, for last year's course, we were pleased to see that 39% of the people who attended in person lived outside of Ann Arbor. So 21% of attendees from Metro Detroit. And to me, it's so obvious that if we didn't have co-leadership from the community members, there's no way that would be, it, that number would be that high. There's absolutely no way. Um, the class is really, seems to be really respected by a lot of food justice, food systems groups in Detroit. And I think it's very clear that because so much of the leadership and decision making comes from um, community members in Detroit. Okay. And keep going. So the last part here to talk about, these are just these slides we can just flip through. Do you want to talk about the internship? Oh yeah, the interns are amazing. So having this partnership uh, with the series has also connected us to uh, students who are looking to intern uh, in Detroit doing work at either uh, Oakland Avenue Farm or Detown Farm. Many of these students have uh, interest in food justice work but have not really been in a community like ours so uh, it's been a way to deepen those relationships and expand their knowledge base but also interact and engage with folks who live in community so it's it's been rewarding for us to have interns spend the summer with us learning uh, and bringing some of their knowledge some of them have traveled abroad and have uh, worked on firms abroad and been able to come back and share some of those experiences. But I think what's really unique is being in an African American community and having, you know, a student from outside of our community come in and spend five or six hours a day with us, three or four times a week, 
and then take that experience back and be able to say, one, Detroit's not so bad, and two, uh, the experiences that they learn are uniquely different than anything else that they connected to. So also, these students are still coming back to volunteer. They're still communicating with us. So these are meaningful re relationships, and I think it will help to advance these uh, young people uh, as they go through life. Cool. So let's, I know we're about to be out of time. I just want to put in a last plug for this class that's going to be starting back in January. So yeah, you can go to the next slide there. So Food Literacy for All, our theme is setting the table for health equity. So more than any other year, this semester is going to be more focused on the connection of health and equity in food systems. So we have a whole lineup of amazing speakers. We're going to do our public blast of who's coming to speak um, next week. So Tuesday nights in January, and we hope to either see you there or you can tune in remotely. Join us. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. That was enlightening and really good background to help us understand how actively we're building toward food sovereignty you know, in our communities in Detroit. We're gonna take some of the questions that we have from our uh, participants. So one of the questions is, you know, when you look at this work, how are you really able to prioritize uh, the black community and people of color in efforts to advance food sovereignty? So we've heard a little bit about, you know, how the course exposed folk to classes and material and information and speakers. How are you engaging um, the actual people in the community itself in, in, in food sovereignty initiatives? Well, I'll begin by saying that both Jerry and I um, lead farms in the city of Detroit, uh, which is the blackest city in the United States. And so on a day-to-day -day basis, we're engaged with community members in building food sovereignty. So the partnership with the University of Michigan through the Food Literacy for All course is really an extension for us, an extension of the work that we're already doing. So they're not, they're not separate things. It builds on the the work that we're already doing in Detroit's African-American community. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, here's a question about the funding uh, for this particular relationship on the food uh, literacy program. Is there funding for the community partners as they participate in the planning and the running of the course? Do you fund um, the, or funding for the speakers who come and where does the funding originate to support uh, this program? So I can answer that one. The answer is yes to all of that. Our, we treat our community co-instructors as an important role, just as a faculty instructor gets paid from the university. So yes, the community co-instructor does get paid. And yes, we think it's very important to pay honorariums, especially to the community members and activists and leaders who are coming and speaking in the class. Um, the answer of how we fund the course has actually been different every single year. So um, we're still working on long-term stable funding, and it's been primarily funded by different sources in the university, different groups in the university. Um, we did have one foundation grant that covered a part of one year, um, but primarily different groups at University of Michigan have funded it, and the last two years has been led by the School for Environment and Sustainability at U of M as the home base and core funder. Great. All right. Thank you for that. And I'm sure people are thinking, how can we do this, you know, in uh, our communities in partnership with uh, our universities? Uh, this next question is specifically for Malik. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, Trevor Johnson says he was listening to the author, uh, Corey Robin, on his recent book, The Enigma of Clarence Thomas. And he suggests that um, Justice Thomas believes that Black communities are better left segregated away from the wi wider world and building their own systems rather than engaging for wider cultural change. What do you think about this approach and how do you balance protecting yourself uh, versus working to uh, change systemic racism? So I certainly don't want to co-sign anything that Clarence Thomas has said. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see in the future. Um, uh, but I do think there is some uh, validity in having uh, African-American communities that have uh, 
um, the ability to build power to define what happens within their own communities. Uh, but the, which is different than legal segregation where black people are not allowed to participate in various aspects of society. But we certainly have the, the right, if we choose to, to live in communities with each other and to uh, create prosperity and create self-determination within those communities. Um, but we have to do that in a way that recognizes that we live on the planet with other people. And so we don't want to build uh, walls and barriers between the various branches of the human family, but at the same time, we want to uphold the right of African Americans and all people to self-determination. Right, thank you for that. Um, this next question has to deal with the link between this work and policy development. Can you share specific examples of where policy work or policy change um, has been done or is being done in relationship to this work for, around food sovereignty? So I can, I can share that we have had a couple of policy related speakers at the Food Literacy for All course. And so this just comes to mind, I think two years ago in the course, we invited Congressman Earl Blumenauer, who's in Oregon, as one of our speakers. And while he was in Michigan, he actually met with representatives of the Detroit Food Policy Council. Um, so met with folks doing local food policy work and that was a neat opportunity to have that connection. Um, again, this year, actually, yeah. Yeah, so I think this year we uh, invited um, Terry Campbell from USDA. Mm -hmm. uh, she actually works, uh, I'm sorry, she works with uh, Senator Debbie Stabenow's office, uh, but uh, through the USDA uh, connection, uh, we have been able to speak to some of the concerns around urban agriculture and have that included in the farm bill. So uh, Terry is going to bring uh, additional information about that this year or okay. at the, the next year. Great, thank you for that. Here's a, a question tied to this at a, at a national or a global level. What implications do you foresee with the UN's 2030 17 sustainability goals, particularly the second one that deals with ending hunger? What kind of um, uh, local context would you see for that as it pertains to uh, advancements in, in food sovereignty in our communities? So maybe I'll take a stab at that and say that uh, the root cause of hunger is not uh, lack of food. It's not mm -hmm. the inability to produce sufficient food for all human beings to have uh, adequate ca calories per day. The root cause of hunger really has to do with an economic system and a political system that concentrates wealth in the hands of a few. And so uh, in order to eliminate hunger, while, while farming is important and production of food is important, what we really have to work on is changing the economic system so that we have greater economic democracy. But it's also very important that we uh, begin to develop more small scale farms. Uh, in fact, the UN has pointed that that is the way forward uh, for increasing food security and food sovereignty throughout the world, moving away from these large scale industrial farms and having more uh, small, uh, either family owned or community owned farms. But it's also important because of the environmental impact of the industrial, the large scale industrial farming and the small scale farming, which is typically sustainable, is uh, sequestering carbon and is really one of the solutions to the climate chaos that we're, that we're facing. So both in terms of um, addressing hunger and climate chaos, small scale farming and localized food systems are the way to go. All right. Thank you for that, Malik. Um, so here's a question about advice. So what advice can you give to predominantly white organizations who have the desire to be more equitable and tend to gravitate toward more visible efforts like publications and webinars and don't really give much attention to their internal processes uh, and, and may not fully understand what it means to be authentic partners um, that are not necessarily reciprocal but and, and, and equitable. So what kind of advice would you give to organizations who desire to change that 
uh, that perspective and way of working. And they're looking at you, Lily. I saw that. <laughs> I guess I have a couple of just big ideas about partnership in general. Is One is that it can't be real short term. You can't just pop into a community, especially a community that has been taken advantage of and has seen groups of power come in and out, and especially white groups come in and out. You can't just come in for a minute and then pop out. So I think for one, just the longevity of the relationship is meaningful and something to think about before entering any kind of partnership. Um, yeah, and I, I, think, I think trust is a big factor here. Uh, like you said, you can't just pop in mm -hmm. uh, to a community and, and think that automatically we're gonna become partners. We have to nurture these relationships mm -hmm. and really build mm -hmm. trust. Mm -hmm. And then you have to honor the culture of these communities, mm -hmm. you know, and, and try and understand mm -hmm. the culture of these mm -hmm. communities mm -hmm. and then take mm -hmm. that in terms of driving. Yeah, power. and I think adding on to that, I think also the power in terms of building a relationship, building trust, the power of showing up is huge and not, not just showing up when your work dictates you have to have this meeting, but showing up and building relationships. I told Malika, I was gonna give him a hard time before this. So, you know, Malika, the only reason I show up to your concerts <laughs> Now, Malik has a great band. You all should go to his concert. It's called Molly Wop. But I do right. think that that layers a relationship beyond, beyond just, just the work meetings or just the actual meetings are, speak, are, are huge. It really, really means a lot. And I will say, you know, my meetings in community are, they feel the vibe is so different um, than how we work, at least in academia or our meetings at the university. And um, yeah, so you're yeah. on with AIDS. <laughs> yes, I, I want to add something else to, to this, uh, this topic, and that is that in order for so-called white people to function as good allies if they're working in predominantly African-American communities, they have to develop an understanding of how race and power function in America. And because of how race and power function in America, white people are not required to confront these issues on a daily basis whereas black people are, are required to confront it every time we leave our house, houses, and sometimes in our own houses, we're required to confront these issues. And so uh, just being a good person or just wanting to do good is not enough. You have to really understand how the idea of whiteness plays out in American society, how anti-blackness plays out, and how that intersects with power so that when white people are coming into black communities, they're doing it in a way which recognizes these power dynamics and hopefully are functioning in a way that builds and reinforces the indigenous black leadership in those communities instead of coming into our communities trying to lead us. Mm -hmm. okay. And speaking of power dynamics, I think it's, it's true for from a white person coming into a predominantly black community and I think especially I'm aware that working at the University of Michigan and representing, regardless of who I am, representing an institution, there's, there's power that comes with that and there's historical and current dynamics that come with that. And so really being able to stare that in the face and recognize that and put that out there right away and confront that is necessary. So one of the ways to stare these things in the face, by the way, is by going through anti-racism anti training. And I would highly recommend that everyone do that, but particularly white people who are interested in moving in a more equitable way, really going to a two or three day training that digs deeply into the idea of race in American society, how that intersects with capital, how that intersects with power, so that they can move through the world in a more conscious way, in a way that can create uh, equity and justice. Great, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and this question, this next question really kind of addresses it uh, from the community side and asks, what struggles have you faced in predominantly African-American communities to help uh, the citizens understand the importance of food sovereignty? So they're asking about for African-Americans and how African-Americans are being moved more toward an understanding of the importance of food sovereignty. So I can speak about uh, the community that I work in. Uh, that dynamic really 
has to do again with who controls the food. So we want, you know, just trying to get people to understand that number one, the land is important to us as a, as a, as a human right. You know, it's our land in our community. And then using that land to produce food that we in our community need is important. But it's, we got to separate people from the stigma of, you know, sharecropping uh, is what people think about in terms of growing food. No, it's not sharecropping. It's growing food for our own health and our own welfare. There's power in that, and we need to control that power. Mm -hmm. So I'll say at D-Town Farm with Detroit Black Community Food Security Network, um, we are very concerned about raising people's awareness about food sovereignty. But the reality is most people don't think about food systems. When they go to buy what they're buying for dinner, they're not thinking about a food system. They're thinking about what's on their plate. And so one of the things that we've tried to do is to, in various ways, get people to think more broadly about how food is produced, where it's produced, and all the dynamics involved in that. And then people can begin to think about where they fit into that process. Because normally people don't see themselves as anything but a consumer in the process, certainly not a person who is beginning to shape that. But also for us, as I said at the beginning of my talk, we frame it within the larger context of black self-determination generally. And I find that many people can relate to that because they see that our communities are disempowered, are disinvested in many ways. And so when we uh, frame the struggle for food sovereignty within that, it makes a lot of sense. One thing that I've seen in Detroit, it really resonates with a lot of people. Although Detroit, as I said earlier, is probably the blackest city in the United States with about 82% of the population being African-American. Uh, there are no African-American owned grocery stores in the city of Detroit. And so the average person in Detroit, whether they're politicized or not, just on their daily kind of interactions in their own neighborhood, on the, in the corner store, in the grocery store, in the gas station, they recognize that an extractive economy is underway, that other people are coming into our community extracting wealth. And also they many times experience disrespect from the very people who are extracting this wealth. And so pointing to examples like that, uh, I found helps people to begin to develop a grasp on this idea of a food system and how they participate in it and why they should be moving more towards food sovereignty. That's great. Um, uh, Cause one of the questions asked was really uh, the strategies for really moving forward with people in community and inviting them to uh, see the system differently and to actually participate in a move toward uh, food sovereignty. I would just ask each of you with one parting comment before we start to move into our wrap up, uh, your choice. And we have additional questions here. Uh, for those of you who have asked questions, we know that we haven't answered them all. And typically what we do is we'll share those with our speakers and invite them to share answers as well as folks from within our steering committee. So for if your question wasn't answered um, during this time, just know that, that we'll be coming back to that and sharing it um, via our uh, listserv. But parting comments from the three of you and then we'll move into our closing. I just want to say that uh, in terms of a sovereign uh, community, we want uh, people to be educated. We want people to be empowered. And, you know, this economic dynamic of money circulating and resources circulating within the community and not being distracted is uh, something that I hope for, for and am working toward. So I'll share that in my in my work and in my life that these these food literacy meetings when I when I have the chance to work with folks like Malik and Jerry and our other community partners and I leave those meetings I am full of energy totally renewed and reinvigorated and it it grounds me of why I got involved in food systems work in the first place and it's just so inspiring and so I just want to share that that is the feeling that I have working in partnership with these amazing beings. 
Yeah, for my parting words, I'd just like to share that I don't think it's possible to have food sovereignty within the context of the current American system. That it's an aspiration, but really in order to have food sovereignty in African American communities, we have to have a massive redistribution of wealth. That we can't have business as usual. And so part of what we try to do, our organization, is to radicalize the food movement more beyond kind of these nice reforms that we often hear about Think about how do we fundamentally shift power in the United States so that African-American people and other people of color have the power to define what happens in our own community. And an important part of that shifting of wealth and power is reparations. There ha if we want justice, there has to be some accounting for the tremendous wealth that was created by African-Americans, what we now call African-Americans, as a result of 200 and some years of forced free labor and the wealth that that created, not only for the United States, but for the entire Western world, which has created the ability of the United States to have this, this robust, prosperous food system. And so if we're really serious about justice and equity, we have to have a massive redistribution of wealth, and the redistribution of land has to be part of that. So I would say that the call for reparations for African Americans, both economic and land reparations, has to be a fundamental part of our struggle for food sovereignty. All right. We want to thank you. Uh, also, we want to thank our participants and remind everyone that this has been recorded and that the recording, the slides will be shared with you. I'm going to turn it uh, to Rich, who's going to share a little bit with us about how uh, to join uh, the group and to access resources. Uh, thank you, Renee, and also thanks to, the, to our panelists. I want to also give a shout out to Luke Reese for uh, being our tech person here today and making sure things run smoothly. Uh, the Racial Equity in the Food System work group, you saw their pictures at the beginning of this uh, webinar. Uh, we do have a, a listserv. There's not a lot on that listserv from the standpoint of a lot of traffic yet, but uh, other than the webinars, uh, but we, uh, we, we do have an active listserv. There's other resources, and you also can see who serves on the committee by going to this, this link. This, uh, this information uh, will also be sent to you as a, uh, as a participant in, the, in today's webinar. And uh, with this, this one, I just want to also say we've, uh, uh, up to this point, we've, uh, uh, as the, as the, the uh, series that, uh, that our three panelists talked about in Ann Arbor, talked about that reach, uh, uh, we've also been very uh, grateful that uh, people from all 50 states, over 100 universities, over 200 uh, plus nonprofits have tuned into these webinars over the last year and a half. So uh, I'm going to turn things over to, to close and say thank you to our moderator, Renee. And again, just thanks to everyone. We certainly appreciate you joining us today. I encourage you to stay connected. We're working on our agenda for next year and using the input and resources that, uh, and, and the input that you give to us. In fact, there'll be a survey coming out shortly. For all we're, Yes, because we're very interested in knowing what topics uh, you'd like to have us discuss and host on um, our series in 2020. Uh, the 2019 is a series is an example of, of responding to the areas that you have most interest in. At this point, we want to uh, bid you good day and uh, peace and respect to all of you uh, through this holiday season, and we look forward to uh, engaging with you again in 2020. Take care and thank you.